afternoon. Buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Select Committee on California-Mexico Binational Affairs, where uh, we're going to have some members trickling in as they, as they go back and forth between compe competing committees. We have several committees that are ongoing in which uh, our members are, are members of those committees, so uh, they may be voting on bills and going through various oversight committees, so as they come in, we'll, we'll welcome the new members. Uh, we're also very pleased to have with us uh, Senator Kevin De Leon that's just sitting in, uh, taking the time to be part of this uh, uh, very important committee. So welcome, welcome, Senator, and we appreciate you being here today. Um, I, want, I want to welcome you to this. Uh, this is the first hearing of the Select Committee on California-Mexico Binational Affairs. I'm honored that my uh, colleagues accepted a join uh, me in this effort to formalize a dialogue, to, uh, to create an exchange of information and create legislative action, hopefully in, in the future, on issues that, that affect the state of California and Mexico. I would like to introduce members of the Select Committee and invite, invite them, if they so choose, to, to make maybe some, uh, some brief comments, if they, if they like. We have, uh, beginning uh, on my left, uh, Katya Oshajian from the 33rd District. Welcome, Mr. Oshajian. Uh, we also have Michael Allen here to my left uh, from the uh, Napa uh, Sonoma area. Of course, Cachos uh, represents the area of San Luis Obispo and its surrounds, a very beautiful area. And uh, uh, Assembly Member Allen represents the uh, Sonoma Napa area, also very beautiful. Uh, we have with us uh, Henry Perea from the 31st District that represents the uh, Fresno area, also very beautiful. <laughs> and we have uh, Manuel Perez from the very prosperous 80th district in the Imperial <laughs> County. Thank you, sir. And uh, we have already introduced our, our uh, good senator, Kevin De Leon, from the LA area. Um, would any, any of you like to make any comments? Mr. Allen? Yes, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. And in, in my own mind, this is an opportunity for us to educate one another and to really to figure out where are the opportunities, where are the problems, and how can we move our partnership forward. So I'm just so pleased to be part of this uh, select committee. I thank uh, Assemblymember Wesso for inviting me to participate. But that's what I really think it is, to really uh, learn from one another. And thank you. Assemblymember Chajian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm looking forward to your leadership in guiding us where we head and uh, looking forward to build up better relationships with our neighbors to the south of us and uh, look forward for an ongoing long-term working relationship where we can improve what's already exists between us. Thank you. Assemblymember Perea. Sure. I just want to begin by um, first thanking uh, our chair, Assemblymember Wesso, for, for putting this select committee together on, I think, one of the most important issues that we'll be facing here in the legislature. And I'm, I'm pleased uh, to be a part of it. I want to thank you for, for including me and just say, as a uh, grandson of a bracero, it, it's great to, to be here and be part of uh, what, what I'm anticipating to be a very healthy discussion to not only help us understand each other and our, our issues a little bit better, uh, but really to focus on, I think, one of the most important issues, and that's the issue of, of economics and, and how we increase trade and, and how we do business with each other. And so I'm very excited to get into that piece of the discussion, uh, representing a region that has a lot of agriculture. In fact, I know we have San Luis Obispo and Napa here, and they boast about their wine. Uh, but one of the things people don't know about the valley is that 80 percent of all the wine grapes that are grown in California come from the Central Valley. And so I'm really excited to talk about that and other agricultural related issues uh, as we talk about uh, our future moving forward. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, sir. Assembly member, uh, did you want to make some, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to as well uh, echo the points made about having this hearing very important hearing and also just want to thank all of you uh, that are here. Many folks I've had the honor of working with over the course of my tenure here and really appreciate working with you and uh, representing the 8th Assembly District, uh, Border District. Uh, obviously we face many challenges as well, high unemployment rates uh, in the 8th Assembly District, but I also see opportunities uh, in which we can collaborate with Mexico, especially Baja California, uh, knowing that Mexico is California's number one uh, trade partner. And as the chair of uh, the Committee on Jobs, Economic Development, and the Economy, 
I definitely support our chair here uh, and his efforts of ensuring that we can continue uh, with trade. And I uh, appreciate the, the, uh, these handouts here that were in the, in the file folder. Appreciate this as, uh, for us to review. But as well, uh, we have a uh, one-pager, Fast Facts, uh, about California-Mexico trade relations uh, pertaining to the economy, uh, Michigan trade policy, job creation, California exports to Mexico. In case folks want to take a look at it, uh, we have copies for you as well. Mercedes is our secretary for the Jobs Committee, and she has copies in case people would like to take a look at that. And with that, I just want to say thank you once again. Senator De Leon. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I want to echo the comments from uh, uh, my colleagues here today. Uh, on behalf of the Senate, uh, our solidarity to you and the members of this uh, committee. It's a very important committee. I want to thank you very much, Ben, for your strong leadership. Uh, you're in a unique position given the fact that being from San Diego, you're from a border region with Tijuana, eh, Baja California. So um, I think you will bring a very uh, a unique perspective uh, with regards to the relationship. California is the eighth largest economy in the entire world. Uh, Mexico is, 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 is very, very important uh, to California and vice versa. And often what's lost in a very polemic and polarizing political climate with regards to anti-immigrant animus and anti-immigrant legislation is a real true economic relationship that exists between uh, California and Mexico. And, and hopefully uh, it will be brought out today uh, during this hearing. So again, thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you very much. And we wanted to have our first meeting address a little bit about the uh, historical relationships between California and Mexico and, uh, and uh, also move into the current relationships between both. Uh, we would like to discuss the status of trade and commerce and its impacts on jobs. And uh, uh, so we, we will begin our, our discussion today beginning with our first panel. Uh, here with us today to talk about the past relationship between California and Mexico, we have Michael Flores, former Chief of Staff and Secretary of Foreign, Foreign Affairs to Gover Governor Gray Davis. And as Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Michael was involved in the operations of the former California Trade Office in Mexico. He also carried out official diplomatic functions on behalf of the State of California, ensuring closer social, economic, and political ties between California and its international partners. Welcome. Uh, uh, Mr. Flores, and uh, we would give you about you know, five to seven minutes for your presentation if you'd like to step forward and maybe begin. I don't think he's going to give a PowerPoint presentation. He's just going to. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Well, I hate to mess with this. I'm trying to create a little room here. Hopefully I won't go over too much over that uh, allotted time. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members. My name is Michael Flores. I am honored to be here with you today. First of all, I'd like to thank you for providing this opportunity, uh, uh, this forum for such an important uh, topic such as California-Mexico relations. Uh, I'd like to begin with to take a few moments and give you a brief history of how California's Office of Foreign Affairs was established and how Governor Davis's administration interacted with Mexico during that time. Now, prior to the election of Governor Davis as governor, I served as his chief of staff in the office of lieutenant governor. And during that last year, we made a strong effort to engage with federal government officials in Mexico City and with state and city officials uh, in the state of Baja California. In fact, in Governor Davis's gubernatorial campaign, he made a promise to improve relationships with Mexico within the first 100 days in office. And I think it's important to note that at the time, the official California-Mexico relations were practically non-existent at that level. Now, we felt at the time it was prudent to reach out and develop strong personal and political ties, given the fact that outside of Mexico, there were more uh, Mexicans, or excuse me, more people of Mexican descent living in California than anywhere else in the world. In fact, I believe the estimates at the time were somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 million. Today, it's roughly about 14 million. Now, we made our first trip to Mexico in the fall of 1997 while he was Lieutenant Governor. There, we met with Foreign Minister uh, Gurria, the Commerce Secretary, Jimenio Blanco, 
and with officials from both sides, both parties of the Mexican Congress. Now we had a very good discussion, but of prime concern was the lack of communication between our state and Mexico City. I was really struck by the frankness of the discussions and I cannot, uh, cannot forget what Foreign Minister Gurria said. He said that if we had diplomatic relations alone, that trade would increase by 20%, just on a relationship. Now, at that time, Mexico was not our number one trading partner, but by the end of our tenure in 2003, they were number one, and they remain number one today. Exports today uh, are in excess of about $21 billion. Now, after Governor Davis was elected, we continued to reach out to Mexican officials, first working with the Mexican ambassador, the Honorable Reyes Herolas. We started to lay the groundwork for him to attend the governor's inauguration. Uh, we also extended uh, invitations to all the border governors. Uh, and on the day of the inauguration, Governor Patricio Martinez of Chihuahua, Governor Gonzalez Alcocer of Baja California, and their spouses were in attendance of the inauguration. And I believe these efforts were key to the development of our strong diplomatic relations with Mexico and its leaders between 1998 and 2003. Now, within the first 30 days in office, Governor Davis, members of his cabinet, business delegation, and academics traveled to Mexico City to meet with President Ernesto Zedillo. And we called the mission La Mano de la, la Amistad, the hand of friendship. And Davis was the first governor in over six years to visit Mexico City. Now, while there, we established strong personal relations at the highest levels of the Mexican government. And on our three-day visit, it culminated with a, a press conference at Los Pinos, which is the Mexican equivalent of the White House. When Governor Davis had extended an invitation for President Cedillo to travel to California, but one of the more important aspects of the trip, I think, was the tone that was struck between both leaders. Governor Davis, Davis made it clear, and I think this is really important, to do this uh, at Los Pinos, was that he said that Mexicans, while in California, would be treated with the dignity and respect they deserve, regardless of their status. Now, they both understood what Foreign Minister Gurillo had said early, earlier, that if we build a sound relationship formed on an honest and open dialogue, our people would reap the benefits. Businesses would come across the border, investors would invest, and economic prosperity would follow. Now, in May 18th of 1999, President Cedillo honored the invitation of Governor Davis by coming to Sacramento, where he became the first Mexican president to address a special joint session of the California legislature. Beginning with President Cedillo's trip and throughout the Davis administration, we regularly brought our respective cabinets together just to discuss areas we would, where we could collaborate on issues that would benefit both California and Mexico. Now, this was unprecedented. Now, if I may, I'd like to point out a few of the accomplishments of those meetings, namely the signing of three cooperative agreements. The first was industrial wastewater monitoring and pretreatment along the California uh, Baja border, implementation of a smog check pilot program in Tijuana, and finally, cooperation in the protection of the Sea of Cortez's ecosystem. Now, with respect to business development, the governor personally arranged with President of Telmex, Carlos Slim, to support for relocating a major branch of Telmex to San Diego. Now, in November of 2000, Mexican President-elect Vicente Fox met with, Cal uh, excuse me, met with Governor Davis in Los Angeles at the annual MALDEF reunion. And Governor Davis later participated in President Fox's historic inauguration in Mexico City. Now, meet while meeting with President Fox prior to the inauguration, the two agreed that they would meet twice a year to reinsure and encourage open and frank discussions of relevant is issues at the time. Now, because we had laid the groundwork and had a foreign affairs office, we were able to transition the existing relationship with President Zadillo's administration over to the next presidential administration. Now, one of the other important aspects of my job as foreign affairs secretary was to serve as the governor's representative uh, on the Board of Governors Conference. Um, the, the organization is headed by 
governors from 10 border states, four from the United States and six from Mexico. The conference culminates annually in the signing of joint declarations that address border issues affecting both countries and all 10 states. Some examples of the work table topics covered were environment, health, public safety, tourism, transportation, and the like. Now this organization continues today. Mr. Martinez here serves as our representative and it's an important uh, tool, I believe, for cross-border communications and policy development for both countries. Next. Now in addition, the California Trade Technology, yes sir, oh I'm, I'm sorry, I thought you were gonna, uh, agency maintained an office in Mexico City managed by Douglas Schmur and the governor's office. Uh, we also had an office of California-Mexico Affairs in San Diego, which was run by Chris and Millie, uh, Aliotti. Now these two offices and individuals were extremely important in the success of the governor's efforts to maintain strong government and business relations. I'd like to share one example of uh, how that relationship and, and uh, um, worked. I was asked to fly down to uh, Mexico City with the Sacramento County Airport officials uh, to observe what would be the culmination of many months of meetings to bring uh, Mexican Airlines to Sacramento. Uh, when we got there, however, meetings fell apart. Uh, they, uh, Mexican Airlines said, we're in no position to make the decision today. Uh, we're three, four months down the road, maybe even possibly a year. Uh, I believe that it was because of the reputation of our office, the, uh, we were able to actually close the deal that day. And uh, it, shortly thereafter, Mexican Airlines started flying into Sacramento. So I, I, I honestly believe that it was because of the relationship that, uh, and reputation that the Office of Foreign Affairs had that we were able to do that. Unfortunately, when we were at our strongest point, the California economy was rocked by a recession in 2003. The Trade and Commerce Office in Mexico City in fact, all of our foreign offices were slated for closure. Uh, unfor unfortunately, it was the legislature at the time felt that we could no longer fund uh, the agency. And finally, the recall of Governor Davis and the departure of the Governor's off uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs uh, brought everything to uh, a halt. So, gentlemen, um, that's a brief history. So now what about the future? There is a need for diplomatic relations, not just with Mexico, but with all nations that want to do business with California. Former Mexican Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs Enrique Beruga stated, the most important relation for Mexico after our relationship with the United States is with the state of California. And why is that? Well, I like to think it's for three reasons. First, our history. We are inextricably linked. Just look at the n names of our towns, for example. San Diego, San Francisco, Sacramento. So, second, our people. As I mentioned earlier, we have at least 14 million people of Mexican descent living and working in California. And then finally, there's our economy. As I mentioned earlier, California exports to Mexico in 2010 alone were more than $21 billion. California's economy is so large and varied that if, if it were a nation, it would rank as the eighth largest economy in the world. I know you've all heard that before. So as leaders, ask yourselves, should California have an international presence? If the answer is yes, will that presence maintain or enhance the well-being of our citizens and by implication, that of the state as a whole? I believe it will. The world, our parents, and our grandparents knew is quickly disappearing. Borders as we have traditionally known them are ceasing to exist. In this new global era, education, training, and access are crucial. Preparing to be the brightest, quickest, and most adept at exploiting this change may be the only way to ensure the well-being of Californians. Stand still, and this new era will leave us behind. Mr. Chairman, Thank you again for entertaining this dialogue. It, it's really an extremely important issue for 
all Californians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll take the companion presentation by uh, Mr. Ricardo Martinez. Uh, he's the Deputy Secretary for the Environmental Justice. Uh, Ricardo is responsible for managing the border environmental program and the agency's initiatives related to California-Mexico affairs, as well as managing the newly created California-Mexico Border Relations Council an organization that identifies new border priorities and fundable projects in areas of infrastructure, trade, environment, health, and security. Welcome, uh, Mr. Martinez, and if you can make a presentation, try to keep to about five or seven minutes, that'd be fantastic. I promise to be shorter than Mr. Flores. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairman, distinguished uh, members of the committee. Again, Ricardo Martinez, I'm Deputy Secretary at California Environmental Protection Agency. Of my portfolio, I handle the, the Border Affairs Program, one that's been in existence now for uh, 15 years. Uh, I'll, I will build upon what uh, Mr. Flores already said. After the departure of Governor Davis, uh, we were left with the task uh, to take what Mr. Flores had put together and basically run with it. My uh, small unit of five people was tasked with this responsibility of continuing the relationship. And during the last 10 years, we've had the privilege of keeping those lines of communication open with Mexico. Uh, particularly in uh, situations of uh, impact to both uh, California and Mexico, and the specific example that I'll cite will be the most recent with the California wildfires, where they, they uh, were burning down in San Diego County. Uh, Mexico offered to send firefighters in to assist us. So that's the type of relationship we've been able to build. Uh, the other reason that we've uh, been very adamant about building a strong relationship with uh, Mexico is that topographically speaking, we are downhill from Mexico. Any flow, controlled or uncontrolled, ends up in our backyard. We have the most polluted waterway in California, in the United States. That's the New River. So again, it's to our advantage to continue that dialogue and enrich that dialogue with those individuals at all three levels of government in Mexico. It's better to make friends and resolve your issue on that side before it gets to us. So having said that, uh, with the void of uh, of the Trade and Commerce Agency leaving and no California-Mexico Affairs uh, office within the governor's office, uh, Fabian Nunez, uh, back in 2006, uh, through his legislation, created uh, the California-Mexico Border Relations Council. That is uh, composed of five cabinet secretaries, the chair of this uh, council being the secretary of Cal EPA. Uh, staff, which is my staff, is the one that staffs this uh, organization. Uh, the highlights of the council or the priorities are basically to create those projects and programs, coordinate those projects and programs and partnerships within the different state agencies. And again, identify the recommendations that are necessary in statute to move our relationship forward in Mexico. Uh, the council is also viewed to be used as a diplomatic arm in the absence of a California-Mexico affairs uh, office within the governor's office. And another example I'll cite is you may know that Mexico sued California uh, on infringing uh, the avocado sales, that we did not allow their avocado sales to come in California. Well, at one time the council said we should be able to use a vehicle of this nature rather than go to the courts where we can dialogue and figure out how we can work together to resolve those issues before they get to the courts. So some of the, the bigger highlights in the last 10 years that we've had uh, in the environment have been we've been able to bring into California over $250 million for 23 projects in along, along the border that has improved our air quality and water quality, and up to $1 billion in projects in Baja California that have improved the livelihood of the residents in California. Again, through these projects, we've been able to eliminate 100 million gallons a day of raw sewage that's been coming over and across the border. So again, it's important to maintain that dialogue, dialogue and presence and to have a coordinating body that's going to be able to transact not only the environment, but public health, uh, business transportation and housing, and of course, the ports of entry, which as you know, last year we had 900 million northbound crossings coming in from Baja California in, into California. Again, I want to highlight uh, some of the unprecedented uh, legislation that's happened in the past. I want to thank uh, in particular uh, Manuel Perez for his leadership and his vision in helping pass uh, AB 1079 for the first time ever. State of California has given state monies to address the New River contamination. $800,000 was uh, given to the project, which is a minuscule amount, but it allowed us to 
obtained $3.2 million in federal funds for a matching grant. Again, this is a far cry from what's needed to, to really address the, uh, the New River contamination pro uh, project. Building on the Board of Governors uh, conference that uh, Mr. Flores mentioned, I do want to mention that in 2008, California was a host for this uh, conference down in uh, Hollywood. For the first time ever, we were, we were able to bring the highest level representatives from the federal governments from both sides. We had secretaries, cabinet secretaries from Mexico as well as the U.S., where we could have uh, frank sit-down discussions. And out of that conversation, we were able to obtain the presidential permit to expand the Otay port of entry down in San Diego. A presidential permit, if you don't know, usually takes about 10 years to, to get. We were able to get that, that in less than half the time. Again, it's the lobbying that this group has as a border group to influence both federal governments. I'll go ahead and end by telling you that uh, we do face many future challenges. I've been able to do, uh, again, of what I've heard and what people told me with my very small unit, which is only five employees and a budget of $500,000, and that's what pays the salaries of these individuals, a lot to really move forward uh, what we've done with California. Uh, I, won't, I won't bog you down with all kinds of reports. I will do highlight these. Under the Davis administration, I was able to publish environmental technology and service opportunities in the Baja California Peninsula. And the biggest question for me here today and to all of California is why are the Japanese selling technology that we could be selling to Mexico? We should be at the forefront selling all of our technology to Mexico. All the wastewater treatment plants, all the components should be coming out of California. I mean, it's no secret that the San Diego Tijuana region alone, it's $6.3 billion in uh, economy. That's more than bringing the Super Bowl three times a year down there. That's more than bringing Madonna and Prince together <laughs> 10 times a year, <laughs> okay? So, <laughs> 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 yes, put it into context, yes. So, so absolutely, I'll end right there. Thank you, you struck a chord from the with the representatives from Los Angeles, and I want to introduce them. We have members that just joined us. We have Council uh, Assembly Member Alejo from the Salinas Valley area. We have Assembly Member Hernandez, Roger Hernandez from, from uh, the St. Gabriel Valley area. We have uh, Ricardo, Assembly Member Ricardo Lara from, from the central Los Angeles, uh, just south of downtown area. <laughs> uh, okay, Bell. And we have Assembly Member Valet, I'm sorry? Okay, yeah, okay. And Bell Gardens, Bell. A lot of bells. Uh, 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 Assembly Member Valadao from the, the Bakersfield area. President down in Bakersfield. President down in Bakersfield, okay. Large, large, very large district. So welcome, all of you. Thank you for being here. We, and uh, we just were joined by uh, Assembly Member Lowenthal from the Long Beach area. Welcome, Sem Assembly Member. I want to I uh, give the uh, members an opportunity to any. Uh, maybe uh, ask any questions of our two speakers, Mr. Michael Flores and Ricardo Martinez, uh, giving us an overview about uh, California relations with Mexico. If anybody has any questions, uh, we can entertain them now before we move to our se second panel. And, and our s second panel will discuss uh, California-Mexico trade and co commerce relationship and the impact it has on job creation. Uh, Assemblymember Ferreira. Sure. J just a quick question, uh, just to follow up on, uh, y you mentioned there were three um, items that uh, former Governor Davis had worked on, the industrial wastewater, the Sea of Cortez, as well as smog check at the border. Are those programs still going? Is, is somebody still responsible for those? What's kind of the... I'll let Ricardo answer that. Sure. Those were actually three agreements that came out of my unit and that were adopted by the governor. And both of, all three of them have come to completion. Uh, I do want to tell you the pretreatment program uh, dispelled a lot of myths about the Tijuana uh, maquiladoras. I, it's, not the, it's not any um, high level pollutants such as lead or cadmium or mercury that's coming across the border. It's really raw sewage. The smog check program was successful for three years, but what it's led to is legislation being passed in Baja California to implement their own program now. And the Sea Cortez one, was basically an analysis of the impacts that the uh, different types of ports were that were going to be built, proposed being built by the Republic of Mexico on the Sea of Cortez and our shared resources. That's come to a uh, uh, finalization as well. Mr. Hernandez, 
Mr. Martinez and, and the rest of the panel, thank you for being here and your participation. I think we're all really excited about uh, moving this committee work forward and enhancing the relationship between Mexico and California. Uh, but my question speaks to uh, the challenges I think that we've seen and the detriment as a result of these challenges with regard to uh, border safety, uh, you know, Americans, Californians making their way down to Baja California. We've seen a dramatic, dramatic decline. Uh, I co-own property in Baja California. And, uh, you know, when I go down the Rosarito now, we don't just don't see the kind of traffic that we used to see there. Uh, I think it's unfortunate because a lot of it is based on uh, an expanded misnomer about safety there. I think um, things aren't as bad as they say they are. You know, that's my impression. But uh, I've got to believe that maybe you've developed some strategies or some recommendations as to how we can better, better tackle um, uh, this, this circumstance. And perhaps we as a committee can uh, find ways of supporting uh, efforts to getting people to, to have that, that mobility back and forth to the borders and where we have that interaction uh, occur at the level it once was. Well, I think, I think the port of entries, the expansion of the port of entries give you a clear indication that traffic is not going to stop anytime soon. Um, I think you bring up a, a point that I think is sensitive to our friends in Mexico. Uh, and again, uh, the image has been given to them by the media. Uh, I personally feel safe when I go down to Mexico. Um, I've, been, I've been to Mexico several times last year, and uh, at any one point in time have I felt uh, threatened. I do think that uh, communication can be improved by uh, authorities, and I'll give you an example. Um, I'll tell you, thank God for Nextel, because Nextel is the only communication link between CHP and their, their counterparts down in uh, Baja California. It's uh, inconceivable to me that we are not on the same radio frequency whereby both authorities during an emergency can communicate effectively. And that's something that needs to be addressed. What better net or safety net can you provide to the residents going down there saying, look, we're, we're in cooperation with the authorities, we monitor the situation, we're able to tell you that, yes, it's safe, yeah, you don't want to be out at midnight, of course. I mean, that's, that's logical. And very basic things, I mean, for our particular unit and for the state of California employees, we provided and put up um, a handbook on how to conduct business in Mexico, and that gives you uh, safety tips. So again, I think the Border Governors Conference, the State Department, its functional equivalents are the sources that we need to be working with. And of course, the security work table of part of the Border Governors Conference is one to really uh, address the situation that, that you're talking about. There was a, there's been an impact with the produce industry significantly, uh, from what I understand. And, but uh, what I can tell you is just from seeing the, the tourist side of it, uh, you, that's been significantly uh, impacted from what I've been able to see in the weekends that I've gotten there. And I think uh, there's others here that have made the same travel and we've been able to see it. We want to see it improve because we think it's good for, for both economies. Uh, so I appreciate your input. Thank you. uh, I'll add just to that, that Baja California is spending a significant amount of money to hire a PR campaign to, again, work on that image. Uh, Baja California authorities have approached me in saying, what can we do to increase uh, our traffic down here, our tourist traffic? Um, at one point in time, they talked about doing a, uh, a, day, a day event up here on the Capitol in San Diego on selling Baja California and vice versa, California selling it to Baja California. So that's just an idea to put on the table. Thank you. And, you know, I want to make, I have two questions. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to address the, the how, uh, you know, the work that was performed under the De Davis administration that increased uh, product sales in Mexico. And while Mexico has become our largest trading partner here in California, uh, we still have the state of Texas, which has a smaller uh, economy, which has a smaller population. Uh, that are succeeding and selling more products in California. Not that I want to necessarily get into a race with Texas to see who sells more, but I if there's a way that uh, uh, a practical way, uh, a feasible way, uh, a fair way to to address that issue and actually succeed in bringing more of our, our products to the market, uh, we, we're having a, a, a you know very successful penetration of the in in international markets of our wine, but it doesn't. It, you know, it's not successfully entering the Mexican market, even if, if there's a, a very large consumer base for that product there. 
Uh, we also have, uh, you know, diverse products. I think we lead in the area of food production in the nation. Of, of, uh, we have some man manufacturing sectors in electronics that, that, that you mentioned that are also, uh, uh, you know, we're very successful in pe penetrating global markets, but our immediate states to the south, uh, it just seems that other people much further away are, are having mu much more success than we are. What can we do as a state? To, to augment that, to increase that, to create an exchange that's beneficial to both sides. And, I, and, I'm, and my next part of that is I'm going to talk about tourism and, and how I think, uh, you know, as a country we can help uh, with the country of Mexico in a way help ourselves. So do you have a... Well, I, I think a we both can answer this. Uh, you know, I would say that Ricardo's uh, data is probably far more relevant than, or current than, than mine. But uh, first of all, I mean, I have a list right here. There's. 25 states that have offices in Mexico, either Mexico City, Guadalajara, uh, you know, somewhere. I mean, you're talking states like Idaho, Missouri, Ohio, uh, including Texas. I, I think it's, well, they have the potato, I guess. That's what, <laughs> what it is. I, I, and my mom's from Idaho, so I have to be careful. But I, for the life of me, I can't understand when we have the eighth largest economy in the world, the amount of trade that we do annually with Mexico, which is in excess of $20 billion, as I said earlier, why we don't have a presence there. If you want to increase, increase goods, then you develop a relationship. It starts at the di diplomatic level, as I mentioned earlier. It really does. Um, you know, uh, it's sort of like the field of dreams. You know, you build it, they will come. Well, you have to build that relationship. Businesses have to have ways to be introduced to other businesses that are abroad. And so I think uh, if you want to increase trade, you want to increase uh, the amount of investment on both sides, uh, you're going to have to put in uh, uh, a, a small investment. I mean, look, when we were in office, it was roughly about $1.5 million uh, to staff the Mexico City office and to staff the California Mexico Affairs office that worked on the border that was here in San, that was in San Diego. So we're talking about a small investment, roughly uh, 25 uh, uh, people, uh, staff. So, uh, you know, uh, it's just, it boggles the mind uh, when you think about it in terms of uh, how big we are and how big we are uh, in this playing field, and yet we're not even in the ball game. So with respect to uh, developing the, the diplomatic relationship, I think we need to make that investment. I think that's where you guys can step in and say, look, in 2003 we were facing a recession. You know, we, we sort of cut our sales team. And when in fact, that was a time when you needed to increase uh, your sales force. You needed to really make a reinvestment in that. Um, so I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, to add to that, what was, what was successful under the Davis administration and under the Schwarzenegger administration, which I was able to participate in, were the trade missions. And again, we need to target uh, those products that we know are going to sell to the Republic of Mexico. Uh, I'm with you, uh, Assembly Member Wessel. Um, we, should, we should be at the forefront selling California wines. Chilean and Spaniard wines should not be in Mexico. I'm sorry. They should come after California wines. Okay? So, so again, we should be at the forefront of that. Not to mention the electronic components that you just said and machinery. The only way we're going to be able to do that is by forming a strong delegation to go sell California. We should do an, an all out campaign on selling California. And that again starts with, as Michael Flores said, a group of individuals that, that know who to reach out to, that know who want to sell their products, and that need to get uh, going with uh, either Mexico City, Guadalajara, or those target areas where we know we're going to have the greatest potential. I mean, it, think about it. He's got a unit of five people. And he's handling basically all the relationships with Mexico. Mm -hmm. I, I, he's doing yeoman's work. Yeah. I don't know how he does it. I had, at my uh, uh, level, I had, you know, I could use uh, the Highway Patrol. I could use Business Transportation Housing Agency. I had a whole host of agencies that I could go to to help implement whatever um, we were trying to do at that time. So, I mean, he's doing yeoman's work. But I'm, you look at it from a, an outside, take yourself, remove yourself from the woods and look at it and say, well, what is California doing? They're not doing anything. Idaho's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the recipe there, as he says, I have five, five staff, and it's just myself, and I'm able to get the work done, but I've done it at the cost of losing my hair, Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 
Thank Come you. On, <coughs> Sorry, I, I came in late, so I, I missed the beginning of your your comments. But you're saying 1.5 million came from the Davis administration. Was that? It was 1.2 million to run our Mexico City office, and a uh, 250 thousand dollars to run our California Mexico Ferrero's office out of San Diego. And was th were those state monies, or were the? Yes, they were. It was uh, under the uh, California Tra Technology Trade and Commerce Agency. Okay. But that was that, abolished uh, in 2003. Right. That was abolished right. by Governor Schwarzenegger. No, that was by uh, abolished by the legislature. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of us miss that agency, and we think it's counterproductive not only for Mexico, but for relationships around the world that could benefit uh, all of our countries. We but is there any prohibition from funding that with private monies? No, um, monies? there is not, from my understanding. In fact, I believe uh, we still, I'm not sure if we have an office in Armenia, but I think that was the only one left standing. There was a, uh, and that was private funding that came in to do that. But I, for example, I believe the one with Mexico, I mean, we have a lot of chambers of commerce. We have a California Hispanic Chamber. I have a regional chamber in the Long Beach area. Um, we have sister cities around California that have relationships. I mean, Long Beach, for as just one example, has a sister friendship right. with Guadalajara. Um, so it would be great to understand how we could revive some of those with monies outside of the state. I, I think a public-private partnership would be a great way to go. I think that would be a great way to start off. Uh, it would show that there's a commitment on behalf of the government and a commitment on behalf of the business community, and I think uh, that's something that ought to be uh, taking a look at. And, and then we'll come Chair to Assembly uh, Member Perea. Let me, let me uh, thank Mr. Flores and Mr. Martinez for your presentation. And uh, definitely appreciate your work, especially uh, the work of Mr. Martinez on the New River. Thank you. Uh, we've come a long way, and well, obviously we still have a ways to go, but uh, it is unprecedented which was what was done. And definitely thank you for what you've done on the ground uh, with all our folks, our constituents, specifically uh, in the Calexico area. I remember the days uh, growing up uh, when I would go visit my, my family, my grandmother in Calexico. And we would cross the border all the time. You know, it would take five minutes to cross, uh, to go to the other side, to go to Mexico, and it would probably take 10 minutes to come back to the state of California, to Calexico. Nowadays, if you want to cross the border uh, by vehicle uh, or by foot, uh, uh, by vehicle, it will probably take you now about two hours uh, to come back. Uh, and by foot, it takes about an hour. Uh, you're waiting in line. And this goes back to the points made uh, earlier. Um, and I'm just wondering, in relation to that, how much has that impacted uh, the area of Calexico uh, and specific to the issue of the goods movement? Um, what can we do there uh, to ensure that we continue trade and to try to, I don't know, lessen the, the amount of time that one is waiting I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that and what's being done currently uh, at either the federal level or perhaps uh, on the other side of the border uh, with Mexico. And I'm also interested in hearing more about uh, a port, uh, Port Colonet, uh, out in the Baja area. Um, I understand that at one time that was a for sure go uh, and a possibility uh, in which uh, goods would be moved uh, through uh, Calexico, uh, from Mexicali through the 80th Assembly District. Um, I'm not sure where that is now, uh, but I just wanted to get an idea as to uh, what your thoughts are on that and what the status is. Okay, so let me make sure I have two, two subjects, Colonet and the wait times at the uh, border ports of entry. Is that? Okay. I'll start off with the wait times at border ports, ports of entry. The San Diego Association of Governments in uh, cooperation with uh, Caltrans published a report about three years ago, precisely named that, the loss of uh, not only man hours but uh, dollars as you wait in the, at the border to, to cross through the ports of entry. That report you can download off uh, the SANDAG. I don't know the, the figures off the top of my head, but I know they were in the millions. 
at how much is lost waiting to cross the border, not to mention the health impact that it has on the workers, on the vehicle drivers, and on the residents of cars and trucks idling there. Again, the, the expansion of the Otay port of entry, the Otay Mesa port of entry, will amel ameliorate some of those uh, problems, but it's not gonna solve them. We need to, again, lobby the federal government. They, they have uh, instituted a pilot tandem la lane in the San Isidro port of entry, and what that is is rather than uh, one car going through, they have two booths where two cars go at the same time. So if you've doubled your, your speed of, of being able to inspect those cars, and of course they have the sentry lane, which costs money to sign up for your sentry lane, but you know that's, again, people that have been confirmed and verified to be able to cross the, uh, the border freely uh, for a fee of $150 a year. So I think what we need to do there, and again, as, uh, as a group, as a board of governors come together, they're the ones that lobby both federal governments because planning needs to take place on both sides of the border. You can't plan one part of the port of entry on one side without planning on the other side. So that's critical. And I think that combined with the border legislative conference will, will give you, I think, the impetus needed for you to move forward. Uh, at one point, the border legislative conference had a great idea which I, did not, I don't think it came to fruition of, of what was safe and rapid transport where you would load the cargo somewhere in Mexico and lock it, seal it, and you would track it with GPS and the electronic lock could be monitored 24 hours a day. So by the time that cargo reached the port of entry, you could tell whether or not that truck had stopped somewhere on the way, how long it had stopped, and if the lock had been tampered with. Knowing that it had not stopped, then you could easily wave them through so they can go and deliver their goods. Okay, I'll now talk about Colonet. And Colonet, as you know, was slated to become a port much bigger than Long Beach. And that was to open the doors and trade to, to uh, Southeast Asia and China. Uh, at one point, uh, they had brought in several companies that uh, had a preliminary design on it. Uh, unfortunately, I think negotiations broke down. The idea was to bring in all the cargo to help alleviate the, uh, the, the, the boats that were not delivering cargo in Long Beach and send those to Ensenada. From there, they were gonna transport them via railway up to Mexicali. And then from Mexicali, they would go up the, the corridor to deliver to Los Angeles. Again, that was the big scheme of the project, but I think negotiations have fallen through. Uh, the funders are, I don't think, uh, uh, at this point interested or the negotiations have broken down. There are a lot of environmental permits that had to be uh, granted. I don't think those came through. Okay, secure, they tell me that uh, secure, fast, 50 trucks tested, uh, that, why don't you go ahead and, or is it? Okay, so it's, there's 50 trucks being tested with, with the, the secure. Okay, so Edgar's telling me that there's 50 trucks being tested right now on a pilot project on uh, the, the idea or project that I told you of secure cargo. Again, this is the type of innovation that we need to be looking at, particularly in California, because we don't have the, the longest border, but we do have the most populated border. We have 50% of the entire U.S.-Mexico border population in our, our 146 miles. If I, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, follow up. So the issue with uh, the port, uh, would you say it's, is it bottom line at the end of the day, is it resources? or is it the lack of political will? Uh, I'm just wondering what we can do as a state legislature to try to, to move that along. Well, I think it's two. I think it's one, it's a lack of resources. Uh, Mexico had to come up with several billions, dollar, billions of dollars. Um, and I think now, uh, as we talk about it, this was a project that uh, President Calderon, Calderon had uh, uh, in his uh, crosshairs, but I, don't, I just don't know if he's gonna have enough time. You know, he's, he's gonna be termed out here in 2012. Um, I think there's a lot of interest from outside business groups, particularly groups from Asia that do want to invest, but they want assurances. Some more questions by Assemblymember Pereira. Sure, just quickly, uh, you discussed the trade missions that both of you were involved with in the past. Of, of all the trade missions you did, what were the most successful? Uh, so that would be my, my first question. And, and so of those trade missions, which do we need to replicate or, or maybe kind of bring back to life? And the second, uh, one of the issues we always deal with coming from an ag community is the issue of invasive species and making sure that we're protecting 
both our ag as well as ag in, in Mexico and just talk a little maybe if you could just talk a little bit about maybe previous efforts uh, in dealing with in dealing with that issue and, and, and is there anything we need to do to uh, build upon that uh, as we move forward so you, you guys can you want to take it? Well, are you talking with respect to uh, Mexican trade missions or just overall trade missions or? Well, yeah, I mean, trade missions that, uh, you know, California was involved with in, in going down. Well, we, Mexico. Uh, well, I guess what, what were the products or what were the commodities that, that, um, that Mexico was most interested in that, that was good for us? I mean, was, was, it, was it agriculture? Was it yeah. water technology? I, mean, I think it was a little bit different. I think in, in our early years, it was a very formative relationship. So what we were trying to do is establish extremely strong diplomatic ties. We had business delegation. We actually did quite a bit in terms of academics. We opened up a, a UC house in Mexico City. We also did one in London as well. Um, I, I really can't point to any particular uh, area. I, I wouldn't say that it was ag. Uh, I think initially, though, uh, environment was a really um, a, a big issue for us. I know it was for Mexico, and that's why we came up within the first year and first mission, those three agreements that I mentioned earlier. Um, mm, okay. I don't know if you well, under the Schwarzenegger administration, we did push agriculture. At, you remember at one time uh, we had a situation with uh, spinach being contaminated. Well, on that particular trip, it coincided with our delegation going down there. The governor made it a point that our spinach was safe and, uh, again, is uh, exporting uh, agricultural goods. The other big commodity that uh, on that delegation uh, was a, a breakthrough was the recycling of uh, computers and electronics. There was a manufacturer actually out of Fresno that was able to sign a, a deal in Mexico City to acquire uh, these components to recycle them. So uh, again, I think it's a, 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 a gamut of different, um, uh, not only uh, sectors, but different commodities that you're able to sell. And again, this is why you need a group of individuals that know the business as well, that are, will be able to reach out, market their ability to take a tra trade delegation down to Mexico City. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on. We have another presentation, but I'd like to thank you for, for being here and presenting. I'd also like to uh, welcome Assembly Member Norma Torres. Uh, welcome. Uh, also a committee member. Uh, you know, before you leave, I just want to make a comment about uh, how, how visionary I thought it was to include. It'd be inter it was interesting that California was advocating for the pre preservation of an environmental uh, asset on the Mexican side, the Sea of Cortez and uh, how important it is, especially when, when we all, uh, we're all, uh, uh, you know, we all live in the same region and, and how those assets belong to the international community but can benefit the Mexican community attracting tourism. And uh, I, I think uh, there are a lot of visitors to, to Baja because of that asset and hopefully, you know, we have to solve this conundrum about getting people to, uh, you know, environmental areas in a way that's, uh, sensitive to the environment, but, but they also the con contribute a livelihood for the people that uh, uh, work on, on, uh, on preserving those resources. It's, it's important that people that, uh, uh, you know, are, are affected by these environmental resources to, f to see them as an asset, to see them as part of their livelihood in an economic sense, not just in an environmental sense. So I just want to thank you for bringing that, that issue up and hopefully we could address similar issues in the future. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here. Chairman, I'll leave you with the invitation that if any assembly member here wants to tour the border, we know it very well and we can set up an environmental tour for any one of you. That'd be great. Thank you. I would encourage you to go beyond the border. Go to Mexico City. Go to Los Pinos. Uh, meet with the leaders and really look at in the future of establishing uh, diplomatic relations at the utmost, at the highest level possible. You talked about earlier about getting stuff done on the border. Well, it starts at the top. It starts with the tone. Things get done when you have the governor who has the ability to pick up the phone and get the president on the phone. Let me cite an example. I took the uh, governor abroad to the Middle East. Uh, one of our last trips, we left, uh, we were in Israel. We left Israel and flew to Cairo, and we met with President Mubarak. I don't know what your thoughts are on President Mubarak, but the fact was we had face-to-face -face meetings with President Mubarak. When we got back, shortly thereafter, the Egyptian airlines blew up out of New York City. 
I was able to get on the phone, call the president, get the governor and the president on the phone. Now, you can't do that if you don't go and make relationships and build and establish those ties. So it's important. I don't know what California had to offer, but the governor wanted to offer his condolences and whatever he could, uh, given his um, purview. But the mere fact that we could pick up the phone and call and get him on the phone just like that said an awful lot about the relationships that we had established by going abroad. That's what I would encourage you to look at in the future. Spend a little now, and you'll reap great benefits in the long run. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you very much for making that final point. We're going to move on to our second panel, and uh, in this panel we're discussing California-Mexico trade and commerce and the relationship and the impact it has on California's economy and job creation. Our first speaker is visiting us all the way from Mexico City. Uh, she is a veteran consultant in the trade industry and once served on Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In collaboration with Mexico's trade promotion agency, Pro Mexico, she designed strategies to promote Mexican business abroad, and previously she was the chief of international trade negotiations in Mexico's Ministry of e Economy, where she developed strateg strategies for Mexico's trade negotiations in Latin America and the Caribbean. Welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. De La Mora, you, and uh, welcome, and I uh, hope you can uh, sh share with us your presentation in maybe seven to 10 minutes. Thank you. Doctor de la Mora, bienvenidos. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I prepared a handout that I'm sure that probably all of you have, so you can follow the presentation with some tables and graphs. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the California-Mexico Relations Committee. Um, I want to thank all of the members for having me here. I want to thank the Mexican General Consulate in Sacramento for the opportunity to participate this day with you today. Um, I want to start by saying that. Uh, uh, yeah, it's on. I want to start by saying that the California-Mexico relation has evolved into a partnership where two communities on both sides of the border have been able to work together to reap the benefits of trade, of economic integration, and joint production and innovation. California has in Mexico an ideal partner to do business. Let me elaborate very briefly. From an economic perspective, Mexico is a strong partner given its stature in the world economy. Mexico is today a global, pay a global player. It is the 15th largest country in the world in terms of size, the 11th largest in terms of population with more than 112 million people. It represents the 14th largest economy in the world and the second largest economy in Latin America, while its middle class is on the grow. Mexico is also a major player in international trade. It is the 10th largest trading country in the world, the 10th largest exporter, the eighth importer, and the first trading nation in Latin America, both as an exporter and as an importer. Mexico is an open economy and a major destination of foreign direct investment. Today, Mexico is the second recipient of foreign direct investment in Latin America, only after Brazil. In the period between 1999 and 2010, Mexico's FDI stock reached more than $250 billion. And what is most significant is that this is productive investment, not portfolio investment. This means that FDI is contributing to create a, an industrial platform that boasts state-of-the-art technology, which includes clean production processes. Mexico's economic liberalization and export-oriented model has been supported with a network of 11 free trade agreements and 27 bilateral investment treaties. As a result today, Mexican exports enjoy preferential access in 43 countries in the world that represent close to 1 billion potential consumers in the world. Without a question, Mexico's most important free trade agreement has been the NAFTA, in place since January 1994. NAFTA has created a win-win situation for Mexico and the U.S., and more specifically for Mexico and California. The NAFTA has made Mexico and the U.S., and Mexico and California, key business partners. Why key? Mexico is the U.S. third largest export market after the European Union and Canada, 
which means that of every dollar the U.S. sells abroad, 12.2 cents are bought by Mexican consumers. Some of the most important U.S. buyers are located just south of the border, not beyond the Pacific. Mexico is also an important supplier to the U.S. market. Today, Mexico represents the fourth largest source of U.S. imports from the world, after China, the EU, and Canada. In 2010, Mexican products accounted for 11% of total U.S. imports from the world. As a result of NAFTA, we know each other better, we are more aware about each other, and we are able to create new business opportunities. One of the most important contributions of NAFTA has been the framework it provided to all companies, small and big, in the manufacturing, in agriculture, or in the services sectors, with clear rules on how to conduct business. The NAFTA offers clear, transparent, and predictable rules, exactly what business needs to operate and succeed. NAFTA has boosted U.S.-Mexico trade. Since NAFTA was implemented in 1994, bilateral trade increased by more than 4.4 times, going from $88 billion to $386 billion last year. This is also true for California. Mexico has become the first destination for the Golden State's exports in the world. Just last year, Mexico bought, bought almost 15% of California's total sales to the world. And among U.S. states, only Texas sells more to Mexico than California. One of the driving forces behind, implementation, behind this performance is the NAFTA, which gave a boost to this relationship. Since 1993, California's exports to Mexico experienced a growth of more than 200% to reach $21 billion in sales, up from $6.5 billion in 1993. This number translates into California exporting to Mexico $57 million every day. This dynamic relationship compares favorably, favorably to California's exports growth to the rest of the world, which was a bit more than 100% during these same years. But these are not just cold numbers. They translate into more business and job opportunities for people on both sides of the border. Not only is Mexico the number one market for California exports in the world, but Mexico sources from a wide array of industries located all over the state. Mexico buys computers and electronic products from the San Jose and Cupertino areas. It buys transportation equipment, machinery, chemicals, plastics, paper, or electrical equipment produced in different communities throughout the state. Mexico also acquires food products from the San Joaquin Valley and textiles and apparel from the LA area, just to name a few leading sectors and regions. And probably something we do not see or we are not aware of is that these numbers and these exports have a real impact on jobs. California-Mexico trade creates jobs both in California and in Mexico. Specifically, in California, according to the Public Policy Institute of California, the Golden State's exports to Mexico has provided opportunities to blue-collar workers who participate in production of above-mentioned sectors. California and Mexico share a common border that is lively and dynamic. Without a question, the U.S.-Mexico border and the California-Mexico border offer a unique comparative advantage which represents a source of competitiveness to our economies. What do I mean by this? Our vicinity has allowed us to establish just-in-time supply systems. It has also allowed us to efficiently integrate production processes that increase our competitiveness. Our markets are hours away, not days away, from the final consumer. This is not minor, especially when we consider how fuel prices can impact transportation and local logistic costs today. Twin city communities such as the San Diego, Tijuana area are amazing poles of economic activity and development, innovation and creation, tourism and education. They show what two cultures and two economies can accomplish. From a Mexican perspective, Mexico's northern border has reached higher levels of development compared to other regions in Mexico, partly as a result of an export-oriented industry that has reached deep levels of integration with the U.S. economy. But growth 
has also put pressure on environment and infrastructure, and we have been able to come up with bilateral solutions. One of the most pressing challenges is developing sources of renewable energy. In order to address the energy challenge, Mexico and California have jointly worked to create solutions by developing projects that involve energy border interconnections. Baja California, for example, has a long history of electricity exchanges with California. In 2009, Mexico's Federal Electricity Commission and the city of Los Angeles signed an agreement to export up to 100 megawatts of geothermal electricity from the, Cerrito, uh, the Cerro Prieto facility in Baja California. There are currently two private electricity exporters in Baja California with a combined generation capacity of 1,316 megawatts, each with independent transmission lines. Electricity trade in the last 10 years has also increased and has shifted dramatically. In slide 11 of the presentation, you will see green lines that indicate current transmission lines on the Mexican side. A new proposed subs substation north of La Rumorosa will be able to connect the wind energy generation on the Mexican side. This is just another dimension of a dynamic and productive Mexico-California relation. I cannot overemphasize Mexico's relevance as a business partner for California. Mexico is a good partner for California to do business, to innovate, and to maintain a leading position in the world economy. Mexico offers macroeconomic stability and clear rules for business. In 2010, the Mexican economy grew 6%. And in 2011, it is expected the growth will be close to 5%, which is higher than the average for developed countries. Let me conclude my remarks by saying that Mexico and the US and Mexico and California share common goals and values. We share the goals of growth, development, and prosperity. Our policies seek to offer our peoples the best quality of life. We know that promoting innovation and technology is the best way to increase productivity. We are aware about the need to have a clean environment and a responsible use of natural resources. Politically speaking, we also share common values. Although Mexico is a very young democracy, we have fully embraced it, and nobody questions this form of government. Elections at the federal, state, and municipal levels are the name of the game. Little by little, civil society is becoming stronger. Issues such as transparency, the rule of law, and freedom of speech are high on the agenda. In 2012, Mexico will hold elections, and I have no doubt that we will see that democracy and clear and transparent elections are the rule. For all these reasons, Mr. Chairman, Mexico is an ideal partner for California. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back with questions after our next two speakers. We're going to move on to our second speaker, Mark Burgat, the Vice President for Government Relationship government relations and chief policy advocate at the California Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, sir. Uh, Mr. Bergan has uh, more than 15 years of experience in public policy, government, telecommunications, and advocacy. Most recently, Mr. Bergan served as director of governmental affairs for the California Cable and Tele Telecommunications Association, where he directed all state legislative activities. Welcome, Mr. Bergan, and uh, hopefully you can share some comments with us? You have five Certainly. Well, thank minutes. you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, for uh, inviting the California State Chamber of Commerce to participate today. Uh, we certainly appreciate that. I'd like to uh, start off by complimenting the first speaker uh, and associating myself with, with her comments. Um, uh, I could not echo more uh, what a quality trading partner uh, Mexico is for California. And from the uh, business community's perspective or the employer community's perspective, uh, trade equals jobs. Uh, trade equals jobs for California and for Mexico. Uh, and as of, uh, as of now and as it has been for many, many years, Mexico has been our number one trading uh, partner. Um, let me start by saying the Cal Chamber has a long history of engagement with Mexico. We regularly uh, travel to Mexico with business leaders uh, in order to promote not only business investments but also tourism uh, among our two countries. I think oftentimes tourism, as was mentioned earlier today, is, uh, is overlooked. It is a, a source of uh, money to both countries. Uh, and when the individuals who come to visit those countries leave, they take memories, they take stories, but they don't take any of our natural goods. So it really is one of the fresh ways to bring money uh, into, uh, into an economy. Uh, in fact, California Chamber of Commerce has led 
um, trade missions to Mexico with three of the last four governors. Uh, we've hosted Mexican dignitaries nine out of the last, uh, nine times in the last five years uh, at our offices here in Sacramento, uh, including former President Vincente Fox. Uh, in order to uh, provide some perspective on the importance of this uh, trading relationship between Mexico and California, I want to reference a, an article that was uh, in print just today in the Wall Street Journal. In the article, Stephen Levy from the Palo Alto Think Tank Center for Continuing Study on California Economy commented that California, as California attempts to emerge from its current recession, job growth currently is being fueled by the three T's, tech, trade, and tourism. Uh, it is not surprising uh, to note that both Mexico and California share those three things in common. Those are the, the are three major uh, economic relationship activities. Uh, Mexico is regularly among the top ten visitors uh, to California. They're also by far our largest trading partner, and much of that trade is in uh, technology goods. Uh, let me provide some statistics on that, hopefully not to uh, to uh, go over again what was said previously. Mexico is the second largest exporter uh, to the United States. Uh, they received exports from the United States in excess of $160 billion in 2010 alone. They're the largest export market for California. They accounted for $21 billion uh, of exports in 2010 alone. That was up from $18 billion in, tw in 2009. This is a growth market for us, even in a time of, uh, of a dwindling economy. In order to put that in perspective, uh, exports to Mexico are $5 billion per year more than they are to Canada, our number two trading partner, and they're approximately $9 billion more than they are to both China and Japan, numbers three and four respectively. Uh, exports to, China or to uh, Mexico are um, four times what our exports are to our number one European exporting country, and that's Germany, and there's seven and a half billion dollars more than we export to all of the European Union combined. Uh, and it's interesting to note that uh, these are the numbers from 2010. Those numbers continue to widen and widen as years go on. On the other side of the ledger, as was mentioned earlier, Mexico purchases 15 percent of all California exports. Computers, again, high tech and transportation goods make up the bulk of this, about 30 percent. And California is the number two purchaser, again behind Texas, of all Mexican goods, uh, and in that again mainly electronics. About 50 percent of our purchases from Mexico are in electronics, again high tech. Um, encouraging this uh, trade between our two countries is NAFTA. Uh, it's been one of the most successful trade agreements in the world since it was implemented over 15 years ago. We believe NAFTA serves employment trading and environmental interests of both the United States and Mexico. It serves the business community and society as a whole. It eliminates barriers to trade. It promotes fair competition, not only investment opportunities and protecting intellectual property rights, but it also provides procedures for resolving disputes uh, between the two trading partners. Since NAFTA was implemented uh, in 1990, early 1994, trade between the NAFTA countries uh, has tripled. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a huge endorsement of this program. Business investment in the United States has increased by 117 percent after NAFTA compared to 45 percent prior to NAFTA. Uh, as the number one trading partner with Mexico, California is the primary beneficiary of this increase in trade. As I mentioned before, trade leads to jobs. As California is perennially in the top exporting, uh, a top exporting state, we also lead the, na uh, lead the nation in export-related jobs. We're one of the 10th largest economies in the world. I heard it said it was eighth earlier. I think when I started here, we were number five, um, but definitely within the top 10. Uh, we'll agree on that. Um, uh, we're the 10th largest economy in the world, and we do international commerce with over 220 countries worldwide, uh, and that international uh, trade accounts for fully one quarter of all the economic activity in California. That is an enormous number. One fourth of the economy in California is driven by international trade. And again, let me reiterate that of those over 220 countries we do business with, Mexico is by far and away our number one trading partner. Uh, in fact, the most recent time period that data is available for, uh, as the budget gets cut, so do certain positions with the government, so we're not able to get these numbers uh, from beyond 2005. 
but we believe uh, what we've seen is uh, in 2005 alone, trade between our two countries supported over 200,000 jobs in California. Uh, as trade with Mexico has grown considerably since that time, uh, one can surmise that the jobs supported by that trade uh, have grown as well. Uh, we continue to work with Mexico. We continue to work with the state and the federal government to provide and encourage ongoing trade with Mexico. Uh, we're proud to be a, a, a trading partner with Mexico, and we hope to uh, continue and encourage that growth uh, as time goes on. Uh, we appreciate your time to testify before the committee. We'll be here for any questions. Thank you. Our, our third and final speaker is Julian Canete, Executive Director for the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr. Canete previously served as President and Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber for six years. He is responsible for the Chamber's legislative procurement, business development initiatives, and programs. Welcome, Mr. Canete, and uh, you, may, you may begin your Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, as they say, I'm on my second tour of duty. But um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I think uh, my two colleagues have said plenty about international trade. Um, you know, in my letter, um, you guys had asked uh, um, for me to comment on uh, focusing on the number of Mexican businesses in our state, the number of jobs they create, and the amount of revenue they bring into the state. And I think you probably asked for that because there's a natural nexus between our Mexican-owned businesses here in California and trade with Mexico. So let me go over a couple of those numbers uh, with you first. Our estimations right now is that over 300,000 Hispanic businesses here in California are of Mexican descent. Not Hispanic owned, but Mexican descent. We, we estimate 35% of those are first generation owned businesses, uh, Spanish speaking. Many of those businesses uh, reside in districts of many of the representatives here, San Diego, Fresno, Calexico, Imperial County, uh, those areas of Central Valley. Um, and I say that uh, for a reason. Uh, the council's office here in California has been working with many of our chambers to develop programs that assist those businesses to grow and, 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 and create new employment opportunities, I think, which is important. Again, I think there's that natural nexus between especially those first generations, generation uh, Mexican-owned businesses and international trade back and forth between Mexico. So I compliment the council's office for the initiative they've taken with many of our chambers throughout the state in setting up programs that address access to capital, um, you know, permitting issues, um, and programs in Spanish. Um, out of all the, the, the Mexican-owned businesses here in California, we estimate they, they generate over $45 billion in revenue in California. They provide for over 46,000 jobs and annual payroll of over $4 billion here in the state. Um, going on to job creation, you know, over, uh, so, so that's basically the overview of Hispanic businesses, uh, Mexican-owned businesses here in California specific. And my poor staff, I told them, you know, they're, 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 they're really easy, you know. When I say Hispanic businesses, they can give you the numbers. When you say, let's break it down now. And so I thank them for all the information they gave and the research they did um, in, in that area. But again, um, I think there's that natural nexus between those businesses, Mexican-owned businesses here in California, and trade in um, in Mexico, and I, I need to say something because I think uh, former Secretary Flores made the point about having uh, relationships at the highest levels in Mexico as they did under the Davis administration. And we found that to be very successful in, in linking our businesses with opportunities in Mexico at that time. So I think, again, that's something this committee should seriously look at and probably implementing in the past. Because over 20 billion in California products are exported uh, to Mexico. Uh, and that represents about 14% of all California exports. Um, thank you. Um, export supported jobs linked to manufacturing account for an estimated 5.3% of California's total private sector employment, and nearly 22% of all manufacturing workers depend on exports uh, to Mexico for their employment. Um, as, as was said, that over 177,000 California jobs, 17% of all export supported jobs are related to uh, commercial relationships with Mexico. Um, more than half of these jobs are due to, to export growth under NAFTA. Um, commerce, tourism, and foreign direct investment from Mexico support more than 200,000 jobs in California, and that amounts to 1.5% of the total number of payroll jobs here in the state. Um, California exports over 20.5 billion worth of goods to Mexico, uh, and that accounts for 14% of California's overall goods and exports. Uh, and of course, we're the 
in the United States we're the second largest exporter behind Texas. I don't know why. I think it's a, that's an issue we need to work on. Uh, but I do say, I will, I will add this in my final comment. I think maybe one of the reasons is, and I know we're working on it, and uh, we've been working very closely with um, Assembly uh, Member Manuel Perez in regulation, regulatory reform, more opportunities for business here in California, uh, more access to capital. So I thank him for those efforts that he's been leading in that field. So thank you, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. We, we, we want to open up to the committee for questions, to our panel, and uh, beginning with uh, Assemblymember Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate uh, the points uh, that were made, and uh, I wanted to maybe uh, ask a question around NAFTA. Uh, and although I can appreciate NAFTA and as well the trade, uh, because we need to develop that relationship and and continuously work as to how we can create jobs. I want to look at the other side of NAFTA um, and uh, maybe push back a little and hear your thoughts on this um, with relation to the maquiladoras uh, that are American owned and going to the other side of the border and even the renewable potential uh, on the other side of the border and the question of the taking of jobs. Uh, I mean, how true is that, uh, that perhaps we are losing uh, California jobs uh, because of manufacturing companies that are American-owned going to the other side of the border? The question of the exploitation of workers uh, on the other side of the border, how true is that as well? Uh, the question of pollution with relation to air and water, uh, how true is that? Um, and so. This is not to say that I don't appreciate, uh, once again, NAFTA, or I don't appreciate the relationship uh, of trade with Mexico, uh, but I just want to push back a little bit and see how true those other concerns that have been raised to me by different entities uh, uh, with relation to our economies, uh, the taking of jobs, the exploitation of the worker, mm -hmm. and pollution. Uh, if I may first. <laughs> And, and I, I thank you, Assembly Member, for bringing up the question. And, and, and you're right, you know, there's, there's good and bad to everything, I think, that we do in, in life. Um, there was just an article, I think it came out uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, where it just says, uh, it was in the uh, San Jose Business Journal, it says about 86,500 jobs in California were displaced from 94 to 2010. I think that's one of the points you're making as a result of trade deficits with Mexico and, you know, cost of doing business. And I think, you know, we, we have been working together with your office and your committee in, in trying to address some of those issues, not necessarily, not necessarily just at the border, but statewide. I think some of those issues rely in the overregulation and some of the overregs that we have um, uh, in regards to maybe how AB 32 is implemented. You know, we support its goals, but at the same time, we realize that it has to be an effort of not just California, but others that surround us if we're going to make any inroads into greenhouse emissions. Um, you know, the cost of doing business. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're all fighting to save enterprise zones. And uh, again, you know, those are the type of things that we need on this side of the border to keep those type of jobs from going over to the other side. So I think, you know, we've, I, I know we've been working hard on it with you and, and your staffers, and I think there's still a lot more work to, 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 to go in that area. Did you want to respond also to that? Um, I just want to um, add a couple of comments with respect to what has been mentioned. On the maquiladora side, um, I think there's um, a different story in Mexico with respect to current maquiladoras. The maquiladoras that operate in Mexico today are not the maquiladoras from the 1960s. There has been an evolution. Um, maquiladoras are part of an integrated production process in North America. Mexican industry, the Mexican economy, oriented to the export sector, is definitely integrated into the U.S. and Canadian production processes. So I would say that we are part of a larger picture of North American industry where most of technology, most of ingenuity comes from the U.S. Um, a lot of production is done in Mexico uh, in combination with um, the U.S. It's not that Mexico produces everything and it's sold in the U.S. market. There is an integrated 
um, channel whereby the, the production chain has different um, stages. And in Mexico, there are different stages that are done, as well as in the US or in Canada, there are different stages that are done. I can very well um, understand that these processes sometimes display displays different kinds of activities and sectors. The question here to, to us should be, the, where, where do the jobs get placed? Are they placed in Asia? Are they placed in North America? Or are they placed elsewhere? And I think that NAFTA has allowed Mexico to contribute to having more jobs here in the region. And I don't think that is minor because that, to the, to the extent that we have, uh, and I, that's a point that I mentioned in my presentation, many of the products that Mexico buys are produced by blue collar workers in the US and specifically in California. Um, and obviously when one person loses his or her job, that is a major issue, that's not minor. But I do think that we need to look in a broader perspective how NAFTA has been able to create those production processes and tho those um, channels of production in North America as opposed to other regions. And um, the second question that I also wanted to, to address is related to the actual border and um, the pressure on the border. It is true that a more dynamic border um, has more needs, and a more dynamic border has more resource, requires more resources. And I do think that we need to be aware, and in Mexico we are aware about the needs to put more attention, resources, and also the kind of correct policies. And I think that we need to coordinate those policies in order to make them successful. For example, we have a NAB bank, the North American Development Bank, which is very poorly funded. And if that bank had more money, I'm sure that we would be able to develop more and better environmental projects that would improve the quality of the border. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just a, a few comments, and I'm actually uh, commenting from a document here that was put out by the Office of the United States Trade Representative, uh, the Office of the Governor, March of 08, talks about uh, the environmental impacts of NAFTA. And it talks about NAFTA has created actually two biennial institutions that were unique to NAFTA. Uh, from that, they've provided nearly $1 billion for 135 environmental infrastructure projects uh, with a total investment of $2.89 billion. They've allocated $33.5 million in assistance, $21.6 million in grants, and 450 border environmental projects. Uh, also, Mexico has increased their federal budget for environmental issues by 81 uh, percent between 03 and 08. So, while we certainly, you know, everything is everything is relative. I think Mexico, as California has moved forward, Mexico has moved forward as well. Uh, they may not be at the same level that we are. I don't know that any uh, state or country is at the same level that we are right now, uh, but we are. We are, we are bringing them, uh, they, are, they are following suit. Uh, I would also say too that, uh, you know, NAFTA is North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, it includes Canada and Mexico. It is a, a, a huge driver uh, in North America. So it's not just, uh, not just Mexico. And trade and economy is now an international issue. Uh, terms like Made in America, Made in California. I know Made in California is currently being debated. Uh, in the legislature, uh, Made in America is currently at the Supreme Court. Uh, what do those terms mean? Uh, does it mean assembled? Are the parts from here? Is the company based here? What does that mean in an international uh, economy? Um, so when we talk about things in terms like that, you don't talk about California, you know, and a hard line, and then Mexico, the two countries and the trade that we have uh, are inex inexorably linked. Uh, products aren't siloed anymore. Companies are now regional, they're national, they're international. Uh, and, and, and frankly, to be very blunt, it also helps us to avoid uh, tariffs, uh, tariffs that we have, uh, uh, that we have suffered, uh, our country has, sometimes with our trading partner Mexico, sometimes with the EU, uh, where we decide not to have free trade and there is a, 
there's a reaction to that. And I think, uh, you know, as we learn <laughs> for every action, there's a, there's a reaction. And we feel that the greater uh, we can keep that free trade open, the better our economy rises, the better their economy rises. We're both linked together. Assembly Member Lara. Thank you, um, Dr. De La Mora. I appreciate your comments, and I, I think uh, your presentation was very eloquent and well taken. Um, but I, I think we're still, you know, as we discuss the issues of trade and so forth, uh, you know, I think we also need to just maybe have, Mr. Chairman, a different conversation at a later date about the issue of security. I mean, about the issue of safety. I mean, it is a big issue, and I know my friend is not afraid to travel the border, and let me tell you, I, I grew up in Tijuana. I spent very, a lot of summers there, and it's been heartbreaking to see what that city has become. My uncle, who is a doctor there, is now moving to Guadalajara because there's no patients. My uncle, who owned various gas stations in Tijuana, was murdered. And so, you know, it is a reality. If we are to really have a conversation about trade, I, I mean, I, I want to know that Mexican officials are serious about really tackling the safety issue because it is a very important thing. And, you know, you might need more than just a PR campaign. We really need to see that there's a concerted effort to really tackle that issue because it is something that apparently seems like it's not going to go away. And it's an issue that we care about on multiple levels, right? We want to ensure that there is trade and that there's success on both sides of the border, but also those are our brethren that are being massacred, right? And so, you know, that is something that we don't take lightly. And, and I think we need to have a conversation, an honest dialogue about, you know, how we alleviate that. Uh, because it is a serious issue and that affects everything, tourism, you know, trade and so forth. And, and I think it merits its individual hearing in the future to have that dialogue because, you know, I'm, I'm a member that represents a heavily Mexican-American population and it, it is something we see in the news every day. And it's not just the LA Times. It is coming from, you know, all over the world. And so it is something that's very near and dear to our hearts but needs to be addressed if we are to continue to be as successful as we can. I mean, I, I don't think we've tapped the, our potential of trading between both California and, the, and, and Mexico. I mean, I'm grateful that there's still strong ties and that's you know, due, due to NAFTA and our, and our geography, but I think the potentials are endless if we were to really talk about and, and fix this, prob this problem uh, of, of you know, the danger that, that it currently exists. Um, and it's really heartbreaking to see, you know, these, you know, Tijuana be the, the place that it is now. My sister moved from Tijuana to San Luis Rio, Colorado, in Sonora, and you know, it, it, we we love Tijuana. We love that. We love that city. And to see it decimated to where it is now is heartbreaking. But you know, those are issues that we care about in my district as well. We have my constituents have a very keen eye to what's happening in their hometowns, and it, it's disheartening to see that there's, I mean, I'm not gonna just pl say the blame on everything. I mean, there's all these theoretical issues of what's going on with drugs and the need and so forth. But, you know, I think we need to have that dialogue. And I'm glad that we're actually meeting as a committee once, I mean, I was a staffer under Marco Fireball and we had this committee and we had these discussions. Uh, and I was a staffer when we had the trade offices throughout the world. Um, and ironically enough, we shut them all down except for the one in Yerevan. Uh, and so, it was, uh, right. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm really excited to be part of this committee and continue this dialogue and, and, and know that, you know, I'm eager to, to have these discussions, but I would love to have an honest and serious discussion and a dialogue about the security issues that currently face the border region. So, thank you. I, you know, uh, an Assembly Member Laura, I, I can't agree with you more. Um, I remember years ago, before all the security issues, is that, you know, when you look at San Diego and Tijuana, it's not two separate economies when in the past. You know, it was one huge regional economy. There were just as many Americans going across to do business as there were uh, Mexicans coming across on this side. So it, it's true, and I think we have to address that, and that dialogue has to begin, and California, I think, has to see how we can assist in that matter because it is important to that entire economy, that entire region for both, for both countries. If I just um, may add a comment, your concern is very well taken and it's um, obviously an issue that is of concern. 
to all of us in Mexico, but I think that we also need to put this in perspective. I live in Mexico, I have two children, I walk to school every day with them, my husband is American, he goes to work every day, and life goes on. I think that the government at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level are doing a very hard job in terms of uh, putting safety back in the communities. It's not an easy job, but it is high on the agenda. And also, there, there are some specific pockets and areas that are of particular concern, but I could not say that that applies to all the country. We have nuances, it's, a black, it's not black and white, there are a lot of grays, and obviously this is a problem that the government is tackling and we as a civil society also need to tackle. We need to grow as a civil society and we're in the process. We're a young democracy, we're a country in transition. But I do think that we have the institutions to handle this and I do not see this as a point of no return. We are in a difficult situation in certain areas of the country and I do think that there is awareness and there is um, this, the seriousness on the part of government and on the part of civil society to do something very specific about this. It's not an easy problem and it will not be solved easily, but we are aware about it. And, and just to give an example, which, which she was citing, uh, the example she gave about uh, some pockets, uh, some areas, uh, some crime being more heavily in some pockets than others. Uh, you know, I saw some statistics that shows that crime rates in Detroit are much higher than Tijuana, and we buy most of our cars from Detroit. It almost seems like we're not going to purchase cars from Detroit because of the crime rates. Well, you know, it, it, I I understand that, and and I understand. You know, there's I I I, I, I echo the sentiments that you know it's very difficult for me to go into certain areas where there there is crime and it needs to be addressed and. Uh, a national focus needs to be put on on those areas to curb whatever the 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 activity is contributing to those crime right. rates. But it, it you know it, it it we have it in our country as well. Oh, absolutely, and I'm not saying it doesn't exist. And and you know love Detroit, but you know there's there's a, a more than just an economic connection to Mexico. You know, and you know I know life goes on, but it's really tough when. Your uncle gets murdered. I mean, life doesn't go on, right? And so um, I understand, and I know it's a civil issue, and I know it's a young democracy. We are a young democracy as well in, in the U.S. Uh, but, you know, it's just something that we have to tackle, and the area of the border is an important area. It's very dynamic for multiple reasons, and that's why, as a California legislator, it's important for me to tackle the issue in Baja because that is a border we share with Mexico. And ensuring that that continues to thrive and it continues to be a safe place so that the interchange of ideas, cultures, I mean, I think we're seeing what's happening in Arizona is a direct impact of the fact that nobody's talking to each other on both sides of the border anymore. And so I don't want that to happen in California. You know, I, I proudly represent California, I'm a Californian, and I wanna make sure that our dialogue remains open and that is a discussion, I mean, about dealing about this issue. And I, I agree, it's a very complicated issue. I want us to be engaged as a committee in this part of this dialogue because it's something that's near and dear to us. You know? So, thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Member Lara. We'll go to Assembly Member Perea, then Assembly Member Torres. Sure, thank you. I just wanted to bring the discussion back a little bit, um, back briefly to NAPA, or NAFTA and, um, and, and uh, some of those issues, only because I, when I started in politics, I worked for um, now retired Congressman Cal Dooley, and he was uh, the lead Democrat in negotiating uh, NAFTA in Washington. And so I got a uh, kind of a front row seat uh, in Washington as we as we talked through this issue. So I, I would agree with you and just reinforce that you know dealing with the issue of tariffs and and, and uh, some of those issues, uh, NAFTA has really I think gone a long way. Uh, while maybe not perfect for everybody, I think it's gone a long way in really improving uh, the relation, the trade relationship between uh, North America. So uh, NAFTA is something I certainly support. Uh, but what I wanted to really ask was just what are some of the practical issues that either the chambers or just business owners 
face when wanting to enhance trade or, or do more trade uh, in Mexico? What, I mean, what are you hearing from some of your members um, about some of the practical things that maybe, in, in I'll, I'll ask that t for answers in, in two ways. One, at the state level, uh, are there things that we can do to make the experience easier on our end? And two, at the federal level, I mean, are there things that we as, as state legislators can emphasize with our federal uh, legislators that things that maybe need to get changed, so. You know, some of our businesses, some of their issues have been getting goods and products over the border in a timely manner. Um, you know, I, I spoke with uh, Congressman uh, Filner on this and, you know, he had a little inside joke saying, you know, we're trying to make it a smart border, but we continue to just make it dumber every day. <laughs> um, so so that, that is probably one of the biggest complaints that I've heard is 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 the the transportation of goods and products in a timely manner across the border and and not having it delayed between inspections and you know I'm not sure all the regs that go in, involved so I guess over regulation and and issues at the border border crossings timing yeah getting across uh, and I I would echo that as well and I think one of the things that the chamber has been talking about now for a couple of years is uh, this idea of certainty uh, and NAFTA was implemented uh, some. 15 years ago, uh, we had a, some trouble with uh, truck crossings uh, between Mexico and the United States. We implemented a pilot program uh, several years ago under the previous administration. The pilot program was then suspended. Uh, we again ran into some problems. Uh, uh, some of the response on that was some tariffs. Uh, we're now talking again, as a matter of fact, just earlier this month, the chamber sent in a letter uh, to DC asking them to re-implement that pilot program and I believe the Obama administration is, is looking at doing exactly that. So for the, for the business community, it can't be overstated uh, how important certainty is in, as to what the rules are, how we interact, uh, and what we do. So that's just one example of that. Okay. The, the, other, the other idea there about transportation is um, you know, how do we make sure that we can get our goods uh, from from Mexico to market or to the manufacturer here in California and vice versa? How do those get back and forth uh, in a timely and expeditious manner? The, the, the countries share a border, uh, yet it takes longer to get to Mexico <laughs> than it does to get to Arizona or yeah. Oregon or Utah or Nevada. And so those border issues, that's, so that's more federal uh, regulations that you're having issues with. Right. I mean, because, I mean, but I think, though, that this committee, uh, through our chair, I mean, it, 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 you know, if we decide to, that could be something that we could engage in, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe through the, his, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus or, or in, in other avenues. Uh, but if I could ask just before you, you move on, um, can you send us, uh, or maybe our chair, a copy of the letter uh, in regards to the, that ch the chamber just yeah. sent? Absolutely. Because uh, th that's something that I think, you know, our, our committee, you know, should we decide to, could maybe get involved in and, and maybe do a letter uh, from this committee or, or as individuals mm -hmm. or however we want to do that. Yeah, so. I think that would be helpful. I'll deliver it to your office. I have a copy here, but it's it's marked up. <laughs> <laughs> Assembly Member Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm also very excited to be a part and be able to participate in this um, uh, committee that has been created or, um, I guess, brought back to what it once was. Uh, it's been at least 20 years since I sold goods to Mexico. Um, in my late teens, I worked for a, um, a Manu not a manufacturer, but a uh, wholesaler of stainless pipe valves and fittings. And at that time, I think you brought up the issue um, of lines of credits and um, the difficulty of um, avail availability of cash um, through the National Bank um, of Mexico. How has that improved? Uh, back then, it was, you know, I, I was selling to a group of folks an average of a million dollars a month. They were looking for American pipe, stainless steel made in the U.S. We could have sold them Taiwanese pipe, um, steel made anywhere else in the world, but they wanted U.S. steel. And a million dollars, you know, it's quite a bit of money. It was quite a bit of money in that economy. It's quite a bit of money in this economy. The difficulty was in the wire transferring of, of the money when they had a project um, not just getting the cash up front, because obviously um, we were not able to extend a line in, of credit to, to that customer as we would to 
um, a customer, let's say in France, we were also selling to Europe. Um, it was easier to sell to France than it was to Mexico at the time. So can you talk a little bit about those challenges? Well, I can assure you that today the financial system in Mexico is far more developed and far more sophisticated than it used to be 20 years ago. For two reasons, one, uh, the NAFTA second, there was a wide opening of the financial sector in Mexico. And today I can assure you that there are many ways in which companies use a, either the commercial banking system to uh, carry out their um, trade operations, but we also have, second point, uh, Banco Mixt, the Mexico's national export bank, which is basically oriented to fund uh, Mexican exports or to fund Mexican uh, international trade activities. And this bank, um, well, as a result of opening the economy and as a result of NAFTA, uh, has acquired a lot of experience. So I can say that NAFTA has also helped Mexico to learn how to trade with the, uh, with the U.S. and knowing how to trade with the U.S. is knowing how to trade with the world. My second point, and I'll be very, very brief, is I think it's really important for us to continue to explore um, and take advantage of, of our cultures, right? Mm -hmm. um, in Pomona, we have the LA County Fair, which is the biggest fair in North America. At one point, we had a, um, we had begun a sisterhood with the Feria of the San Marcos. Um, you know, at some point that stopped, and I, and I think it's really important to continue those relationships, uh, not only in, in Southern California, but also in Northern California. Mr. Consul, <laughs> you, he will be responsible for getting that done. Sorry, I, wasn't, I didn't have my mic on, but I hope most of you heard that. Uh, so I want to thank you for uh, starting this discussion. And w we want to open it up to the public and have take on some public comment as our, our next order of business. And we have one person from the community is, uh, that uh, has requested to uh, share some comments. Uh, David uh, or David Rodriguez. Rodriguez, are you here, David Rodriguez? Do we still have, would you like to speak, sir? Did you, did you make a request to make some comments? Uh, you can, uh, why don't you uh, maybe have a seat at the, p the table. And have a seat here. And and, and uh, if you can make your comments in about two minutes, if that's possible. I'm sorry? If you can make your comments in about two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay, um, well, my name is Davi Rodriguez, and I represent Save Our State. Uh, some people probably heard of us because we've stood outside of day labor centers and uh, Home Depots and Montebello and high schools to oppose the Mexican influence in our communities. Um, I was born and raised in California, and uh, I have been to Mexico numerous times. Uh, over the years, though, I have developed a bit of a mistrust for the country, and um, I'm starting to distrust the business community because it seems like they are intertwining with each other and leaving the, the community out of this. Um, I, I am a businessman, to uh, it was, and, and I, I don't have a problem with this uh, a trade between countries. But I feel that uh, trade is now becoming uh, um, paramount and, and it does not benefit the overall community anymore. This NAFTA thing has drawn millions of people northward. 
and uh, a lot of them have uh, come here illegally. And we see the business community kind of winking at this. So yes, we start to um, uh, have a bad attitude uh, towards the immigration system and towards the relationship with Mexico. And people have, have stood here and said, well, how can we speed up the, the border uh, crossings and such? And, and really, uh, the resistance to that is, is exactly coming from people like us and organizations like us. We don't trust what's going on anymore. Um, also, Californians like us have been shouldering an unfair burden for 10 to 15 years. Mexico has uh, basically abandoned millions of their citizens and left them on our doorstep. We have been taking care of them, the California taxpayer. And uh, it's, um, uh, we, we feel like they um, are um, wards of California, if you will, or uh, we are foster parents and Mexico is the deadbeat dad. Thanks. Well, if you couldn't just sum up your comments, your time's up. My time's up. Okay. Well, um, I'll sum it up and, and just say this. Uh, if you want the, the hateful rhetoric, as I've heard it called, to stop, and so things can improve between Mexico and the United States and Mexico and California, you're going to have to start observing some propriety in the way the business community deals with the public and obeying the law and not wink at things, okay? Sir. Thank you very much. And again, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for being part of these, uh, uh, these proceedings today. I kind of identified some of the subject matter that we, we want to take up in the future. And I want to make some announcements to all the members of the public, and committee members. Uh, uh, beginning with a resolution that was presented yesterday to the Mexican Consulate and the Cien Amigos Group rec recognizing May 9th, 2011 as Mexican California Advocacy. And I just want to congratulate uh, everyone that was part of that uh, presentation. It was a wonderful presentation and it's nice to have friends that work uh, toward a common goal of, of I increasing uh, a, a bit bridge and better relations between uh, our friends uh, to the south in Mexico. Uh, I also want to remind that we'll be having a reception uh, tonight celebrating this occasion uh, from 5 to 7 at the Leland Stanford Mansion at 800 N Street, and all, all of you are welcome. Uh, the second meeting of the Select Committee is tentatively scheduled. We're working on a calendar uh, to hear uh, some uh, other uh, uh, matters and other subjects that are important to the uh, within the purview of this committee, and the next uh, meeting is scheduled tentatively August 12th through 13th. We're looking at potentially hosting this event either in San Diego or maybe even in, in, in Baja California. So we're working toward that end. Um, <coughs> uh, you know, in just uh, in some of the matters that, that were raised today, I just want to share uh, m my. Uh, belief that it's important to create jobs both in California and Mexico. If we can accomplish that over, over possibly creating jobs in other parts of the world, to, to work first to create a prosperity and stability within our, our immediate environment, I think it, it should be uh, of, of the utmost importance to, to people in North America. Very rarely do we talk about, you know, the Monroe do Doctrine that was that was proclaimed almost, uh, you know, what was it, eight, 1820. We're talking about uh, 190 years ago, almost 200 years ago since, uh, you know, a president from, you know, the northeastern part of the United States <coughs> talking about the importance of cooperation between governments of the Americas to, to ensure not only our, 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 na our national defense but also our, our common prosperity because we share Common resources, common goals, common values, and and I want to I want to continue to in that spirit talk about what we can do together to help us uh, guide us through uh, what what the future is 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 uh, uh, you know gonna uh, present us the obstacles presenting us uh, in dealing with environmental issues with global trade with the, the globalization of the world and how, how we can work together to make sure that we position ourselves to, to do better in, in terms of that, that uh, global debate. But I want to thank everybody for your participation. Uh, it's really nice to have 
this level of interest from our community. And I, again, I want to welcome the visitors from Mexico, those ustedes que han venido para uh, in, in, uh, representando a México, muy, una muy bienvenida de parte de todos nosotros. Uh, los aceptamos aquí con los brazos abiertos y con uh, un espíritu de diálogo para que podamos seguir uh, hablando sobre todos los asuntos que, que nos, uh, que, que nos, uh, uh, que, que son de gran importancia para todos nosotros. Entonces, uh, bienvenidas y buenas noches y los esperamos ahora en la cena en la mansión de, de Stanford, que está aquí cerquita, le damos información si quieren asistir. Gracias y buenas noches.